Thank you. I'm really so pleased to be here. Um, you know, the Feminist Majority Foundation really couldn't exist without women's studies and uh, the work that's done at CSW and uh, other uh, research institutes around the country. And, and neither could Ms. Magazine in so many ways. In fact, the, the history of women's studies and gender studies and the uh, uh, history of, of the feminist movement and of Ms. Magazine are so intertwined, it's uh, hard to know where one stops and, and one begins. And so we've always viewed these relationships as critically important. Um, and I, I'm very pleased to be here today. And I also want to thank Rachel and thank Karen for uh, all of the work to, to make this happen. So I I want to give you some hope by time you leave here today. I'm going to turn this a little bit. Is that all right? Or look at this way to sort of see everybody. Right. Um, it's not all, it's not all red, although in many days it feels that way. You know, you know a year ago we were all extraordinarily hopeful. Um, that we would have elected the first woman president, the first feminist woman president in the history of the United States. And I am certain that many, many of you who were heavily involved in different aspects of the campaign, whether you were active in the campaign, phone banking, you might have even come to our offices to phone bank, uh, possibly traveling to Nevada, which was a battleground state, and very, very key. Donating, of course, um, involved in any number of ways. Um, and all of us, I think, uh, woke up, the, well, stayed up that night and uh, were bitterly, bitterly disappointed. Uh, it really, I think, was a blow to our kind of person um, that so many of us had worked for uh, the empowerment of women and girls in all levels of decision making. And we, we knew the odds, right? We knew, but I think we could never have anticipated the unimaginable, which was uh, that Trump would win the election. He won by only 77,000 votes, and we can't forget that. Um, 77,000 votes spread over three states, um, the states of Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Uh, and don't forget that Hillary won the popular vote by over three million uh, at the end of uh, the day. So it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't as though it was a rejection, but the, uh, the way the system is structured, uh, he, of course, walks away with the victory. Uh, 77,000 votes. Um, the good news is that Hillary not only won with 3 million votes, the popular vote, she won with a majority of women. 54% of all women voted for Hillary. 94% um, of black women, 68% of Latinas, 51% of white college-educated women, 62% of single women, 63% of millennial women. So, had only women been allowed to fight, <laughs> she would have won in a landslide and it would be a very different day. Uh, by contrast, 63% of white men voted for Trump, as did 62% of white non-college-educated women. Only 41% of all men voted for Hillary. And here's another shocking statistic, only 47% of millennial men voted for Hillary. Yeah. <laughs> um, within every demographic that you can think of, within race, within ethnicity, age, income, no matter what the demographic, there was a gender gap, a significant gender gap, with far more women voting for Hillary than men. Uh, so among uh, African Americans, far more African American women voted for Hillary um, than did African American men. Same thing with Latinos, same thing with older, younger, all, all income categories, it didn't matter. Uh, there's been a lot written, uh, a lot of analysis about what happened. Uh, and you know, I don't know if there's been yet a definitive analysis. There were so many moving parts and so many factors that impacted on the election. Uh, most importantly, we know that the policies that were promoted by the Trump campaign and the Republicans in Congress and the Republican Party platform do not have a popular mandate. Period. End of sentence. Including up until today when it was believed that he was going to withdraw from the Paris Climate Accords. That's not in keeping with where the vast majority of people in this country are. 
So don't forget that either, that it wasn't the policies that were being promoted uh, that were the determining factor at the end of the day. Uh, on issues such as equality and civil rights, workplace opportunity for women, education equity for girls, non-discrimination of LGBT communities, immigration, ending gender-based violence, reversing the damage to our environment, strong majorities of the population disagree with Trump and with the Republican-controlled Congress. Flat out. We know that voter suppression played a major role in the outcome of this election. Let me tell you about a recent study of the voting patterns in Wisconsin. Some 200,000 primarily African-American votes in Milwaukee were disqualified from voting. That's in a state that Hillary lost by only 22,748 votes. 200,000 voter suppression, 22,000, 23,000 vote margin. So had the voter ID laws not been passed in Wisconsin, had they not been uh, enforced unconstitutionally, the outcome in Wisconsin would have been very different. In North Carolina, we know that voter suppression laws cut into early voting significantly, um, also creating a photo ID requirement and eliminated same-day registration, which young people especially take advantage of. Um, Out-of-precinct voting was eliminated, and pre-registration of high school students was eliminated. All of that eliminated by a Republican-controlled state legislature following the 2010 elections. More than half of all voters in North Carolina typically uh, vote early, especially the African American community at much higher rates. North Carolina law was recently struck down by the Federal Appeals Court that said it had been constructed, and constructed with, uh, quote, such surgical precision targeting African Americans. And the Supreme Court just about two weeks ago refused to hear the state's appeal um, so in other, uh, in other words, that uh, those voter restriction laws are dead for now. But of course, the Republicans who still control the state legislature there by a margin have vowed to immediately work up some new laws uh, that will undoubtedly also prove to be unconstitutional. In other states, voter rolls were purged. Um, the, uh, the Republican-controlled uh, secretaries of state were comparing voter rolls uh, among different states and eliminating uh, people with the same names. Well, people have the same names. Um, but those were being uh, struck from the voter rolls. And to get back on a, on a voter roll the day of the election when you show up and your name has been taken off is pretty challenging, especially if you only have a few minutes before you have to run off to work or, or something else. So we know that voter suppression played a role in the outcome of this election. We don't know yet. Um, how significant the manipulation and interference by Russia was in our election. We do know the consensus of opinion across all of the intelligence agencies is that it was significant and it was multifaceted. It wasn't just that they hacked into the electronic databases of the DNC. Uh, it wasn't just that they were able to hack into the campaign chair, a, a director of Hillary Clinton, John Podesta, uh, and that they released all of this in a very orchestrated way to sow dissension within the ranks of the Democratic Party, uh, but also to cast doubt on the veracity of the Democratic candidate and the entire election process. The ultimate goal of, of Russian interference, in addition to impacting this election, which they did, there's just no question, by the way, they also um, interfered through fake news um, with the whole Bernie Sanders crowd. Yep. Um, they were constantly feeding those Facebook pages, the secret Facebook groups, all of the groups that informed around Bernie Sanders with disinformation about Hillary Clinton. And I'll tell you, I, I was at the convention, you could see it play out on the floor of the convention. The rancor and the dissension within the party was very large. And it was this past weekend, too, for the California Democratic Party Convention. It has not stopped. Um, and so that was also part of the Russian interference with the election. 
It was to create this cynicism and this and this rancor within the ranks of uh, the Bernie Sanders supporters um, to depress the vote, and it worked. Uh, that I think is what was heavily reflected in the millennial men's vote. The millennial women came around, 63% voting for Hillary Clinton at the end of the day, but only 47% of millennial men. Now, millennial men, only 42% of them voted for Trump, but the difference there was the vote for the third party candidates, or fourth party candidates in, in our case. Um, those fourth and third party votes alone in the state of Philadelphia and Michigan tip the outcome in those states. So that is ultimately where, where the impact really was. You know, we, we hear from Trump and his cronies that there was no real direct impact on the outcome of the election. But I think that is simply disinformation. When we know the extent of what happened and how it played out, I think we'll be able to say definitively that the Russians were able to influence the outcome of this election decisively. Um, the other thing the Russians were doing was to cast doubt on our, our uh, election process itself, um, to uh, create doubt and cynicism about elections. Uh, remember, Trump started that from the months before the general, that the election was being manipulated and hacked and you couldn't trust the outcome. That our people don't trust that they can go and vote and their vote will be counted and that it matters is a very bad sentiment to be fanning the flames with. Uh, to depress voter enthusiasm and voter turnout is very dangerous um, in these times. So we, we, we know those were all factors. And of course, Jane Comey's um, actions exacerbated the anti hillary sentiments that had already set in. And we don't know how all that's going to come out either at the end of the day. Um, it's going to be interesting to watch. It's like you can't put yourself away from a television set. Sort of every day there's a new development that you just, and I have my own theories if you want to hear them afterwards about what's happening. But um, our hope, of course, is that the multiple investigations uh, will ultimately result in, um, frankly, some prosecutions, uh, among other things that could happen. Um, and that we'll get to the bottom of this for our own, uh, the sake of our, of our democracy and the sake of the future of this country. But for now, we're left to deal with the consequences. And make no mistake, the dangers ahead are very real. And for women and girls, the Trump administration's policies threaten to turn back the clock on our progress by some 50 years. His just released budget will decimate health care funding for millions of poor women and children and men. It hits especially hard at elderly women in nursing homes. Some 75% of elderly women in nursing homes depend on Medicaid, uh, which uh, his budget is not only dramatically cutting, but is reorganizing so that uh, many will lose their coverage as a result, if it passes, if it passes. Um, his budget also cuts funding for the violence against women office. Uh, his budget decimates federal funding for education, especially college-bound students who rely on work-study programs and public service scholarships. His Department of Education is gutting the enforcement of Title IX for sexual assault on campuses. And he's abandoned the application of Title IX to stop discrimination against transgender students. He not only has reimposed, but he also expanded the global gap rule endangering the lives of millions of women around the world. And then there was the worst loss so far, his nomination to the Supreme Court of Neil Gorsuch. Gorsuch has been a constant vote against women's reproductive health and rights. He voted to support Utah's ability to defund Planned Parenthood. He imposed himself into the Hobby Lobby case, um, demanding that his views be taken into account. Um, he voted to allow um, Hobby Lobby, a corporation, because of its religious beliefs. I mean, who knew a corporation could have religious beliefs? 
um, they have to determine whether or not they were going to provide contraception to their employees. He's consistently uh, voted against plaintiffs in civil rights cases and against the separation of church and state. He espouses what's called an originalist philosophy, meaning that he believes that all of the Constitution and its amendments, all provisions of the Constitution, should only be interpreted to mean what they meant at the time they were written and adopted. Uh, we should remind him that you know 240 years ago, women were chattel. The word women does ne never appears in the Constitution, not even the 19th Amendment. Um, uh, recognizing women's rights to vote doesn't mention women. Um, and so the, the rights that we now enjoy, the rights to abortion, the rights to birth control, the right to marriage equality for gays and lesbians, no protection in the Constitution according to this originalist philosophy. Because the original writers of the Constitution never intended for these groups uh, or these rights to be incorporated and protected. Uh, so in a sense, um, there simply is no protection for women in the Constitution against discrimination. Uh, the Equal Protection Clause was not written to include women when it was uh, written. So that philosophy can take us back severely in time on our rights. Right now, we have five votes on the Supreme Court to uphold Roe versus Wade. Five votes, five out of nine, five to four. That is where we are at right now with the Roe versus Wade um, decision. One more vote, the loss of one of our uh, five votes, replaced by someone like a person who has an originalist philosophy, we could very well see the loss of legal abortion and birth control, and as I said, ultimately, same-sex marriage. They all are under this uh, uh, umbrella of the right to privacy. The um, Senate Judiciary Committee Chair Chuck Grassley recently announced that he anticipates another retirement this summer from the Supreme Court. Everybody speculates it's Kennedy who is the fifth vote right now on the court. He's been the swing vote on the right to abortion his entire time on the court. So if we should lose him uh, and see his, his uh, position replaced, it, it's going to be a very dangerous period. So we have no choice. Uh, we have to fight to meet this historic challenge. The well-being of tens of millions of us in the United States and, and billions of women and girls worldwide depend on. They depend on us continuing our fight to it. And that's why last November, the cover of this magazine, um, a special election issue, uh, featured the words, never go back. And we have, to, we have to make that decision that we are not going back. And to do that, we're urging feminists everywhere to be involved as never before, and to organize as never before. And you can see the results on January 21st of women organizing. An estimated 5.6 million of us marched worldwide in 999 separate marches uh, throughout the U.S. and in 92 countries and on all seven continents, even in Antarctica. Uh, in small towns and large cities and blue states and red states, uh, women marched and men alongside them with their families uh, in the pouring rain and uh, snowstorms and blizzards uh, and in, on sunny beaches and, and in the bitter cold. Uh, everywhere, everywhere. And here in Los Angeles, 750,000 of us marched. <laughs> Uh, record numbers um, everywhere. Never in history have so many people taken to the streets on the same day for the same cause. That's how significant January 21st was. And our signs told the whole story. Uh, we reminded uh, the world that women's rights are human rights, um, that we want to end violence, ensure civil rights and racial justice, protect our reproductive rights, stand up for workers and immigrants, LGBT people and those with disabilities, and that we want to prioritize the environment so that we have a future that we can all thrive in. These demonstrations against Trump and against the Republican agenda have not let up. We chronicled all the uh, 
demonstrations up until the time we published the spring issue of MIS, which was a tribute to the women's marches all over the U.S. and around the world. Uh, even the science marches. Who knew you had to march for science, right? On April the 22nd, there were 600 separate marches worldwide. It was the second largest number of people only next to the women's marches on January 21st. So there's been this incredible outpouring of opposition to Trump's agenda. Feminist Majority uh, is part of that organizing. We're a nationwide uh, women's rights organization. Uh, and we work in coalition and in collaboration with our sister organizations and allies, including Neighbor Out, Planned Parenthood, LGBT and Civil Rights, and Women's Rights Groups, as well as we work on college campuses. We have about 635 campuses that are affiliated through our Choices Campus Leadership Program. And many, many of, of the uh, college students have led the activism in their local communities. We're also in high schools. Um, and uh, we've seen this incredible organizing across the board uh, and this incredible collaboration across the board. Um, and though we've lost some battles, we're also winning. So I, I told you the, the battles we've lost. Now let me tell you some of the battles that we've won. There was so much opposition to most of the cabinet nominees that many of them were forced to withdraw before the vote. And uh, many of them barely eat through on a strict party line vote, for the most part. Betsy DeVos was uh, so opposed uh, by both Democrats and Republicans that in an unprecedented scene, the Vice President had to go to the Senate to cast the tiebreaking vote. Um, that's how strong the opposition to her and to the Trump agenda on education has been. So massive was the outcry against efforts to repeal Obamacare or the ACA that the very first version of Trump Care went down in flames, not even getting to a vote in Congress. The second Trump Care replacement bill passed the House, but barely, and only after tremendous arm twisting. Only 20% of public supports this new version of Trump Care. And the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, essentially said it was dead on arrival in the U.S. Senate. They would start over and write their own version of Trump Care, which is going to be a very difficult hurdle for them to get over. Now, did you notice it was uh, the appointed 13 men, old, old white men, 13. Um, it didn't take long before Senator Feinstein and Kamala Harris and almost every woman in the Senate said, what? What? Um, one of the um, senators, of course, said uh, he could never understand why he had to pay for maternity care, proving our point <laughs> that you need uh, diversity among those writing the nation's health care laws. Uh, and another uh, senator said, yeah, he, he would be sure he didn't want to give up his mammogram, so he'd be sure to make sure that, that was protected. So I think it's um, but we're seeing it play out this week in all the congressional recesses, the town halls, the still massive opposition to what they're attempting to do. And we have an article in the, in the new issue of this, which will be the summer issue, out in just a couple of weeks, that goes through this new this Trump care version that came to the House. Uh, you know, our, our rights to access birth control, contraception, maternity coverage, uh, uh, preventive health care across the board, the whole preventive health care package that we've enjoyed under Obamacare, all of that is on the chopping block. We're going to have to fight very hard uh, to, to uh, defeat this in the Senate. But it, there's so much dissension around this in the Senate, I think we have a, a very good chance. So, and even opposition to Gorsuch uh, nomination on the court was so massive that the Republicans had to change the rules. A rule that had existed for 167 years to get him approved. That's how much opposition there was in the U.S. Senate. I know that uh, all over the country, uh, grassroots groups have formed, uh, many of them led by women, uh, and including many of you are probably members of, uh, of a grassroots group that has begun to organize even since the election. 
Um, that's what we're seeing all across the country and the participation in the town halls and, and such activity is really, I don't think the country has ever seen on this kind of a scale. Um, if any of you are in, affiliated with the group and you'd like to um, take advantage of the information that the feminist majority produces in our campaigns, I welcome you to let us know um, so that we can get you involved and, and get you the information that you need. The key message today that I have is, is the importance of all of us to keep fighting. Um, it gives our allies in the Senate and the House real courage to make, to make the fight. You know, there's only 100 members of the United States Senate. In, in fact, it really is a pretty small club. And they see each other day in and day out. Uh, and it gets very hard um, to keep fighting to the point that your colleagues accuse you of being disruptive and unreasonable. Um, and, and so we've got to be there for them. We've got to give them the courage they need to make the fight. When we started the fight on Gorsuch, uh, the feminist majority was one of the first organizations on the day he was nominated to call for a filibuster. We saw no other choice. There was a lot of debate uh, about whether you make your stand now, uh, because after all, Gorsuch was replacing Scalia, that very similar philosophies of originalism. Scalia even said of Gorsuch one time that Gorsuch was even more conservative. Um, but there was a lot of debate. Do you make your stand now, or do you hold the filibuster until the next? nomination, which could be the fifth vote on Rome. We made the argument that you had to make the fight. You had to make the fight because the constituency in this country that depends on our representatives in Congress making our fight for us had to know that you were willing to go to the mat and that you were willing to risk um, loss of the filibuster. We also said that it wouldn't matter because if they didn't change the rules on Gorsuch, they would change the rules on the next one. So you, we had to alert the world, alert our constituency, alert the country of the dangers we face with a court that is increasingly stacked by right-wing ideologues. And I think we did that. I think people woke up. Um, and the next fight will be even bigger. The next fight will be even more critical in many ways. So I encourage all of you to stay engaged. Uh, we've got to be sure that we stand behind Senator Dianne Feinstein and Senator Kamala Harris. They're critical voices in the United States Senate. I just want to say, I know this is a this is the CSW and uh, this is not a political uh, electoral arena, but I hope we'll all encourage Dianne Feinstein to run again. She is the most senior woman now in the United States Senate. She has extraordinary influence across the aisle, and she's on the Intelligence Committee. And let's not forget, she was the only one to really um, pursue some of the past intelligence scandals um, to the bitter end. Um, she's also on Judiciary, and we need her there to make the fights for us on not only the next Supreme Court nomination, but some of these other laws that the Republicans are going to try and pass. We also need to stand behind Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi. She is fighting like there's no tomorrow to have the resources and recruit the candidates to take back the House in 2018. I think it's our only hope for getting one part of a branch of, of government back in the hands of reasonable people. Um, I don't, to, to retake the Senate will be very hard. Um, it's just the way the election happens to fall. Far more Democrats are up for re-election in 2018 in the U.S. Senate than Republicans. Um, in 2016, it was just the opposite. There were more Republicans up. And so we actually made some gains. Uh, we held on to our seat in Nevada uh, when Harry Reid retired. We got a tremendous uh, Latina feminist, um, Catherine Cortez Masto, um, in the United States Senate. We took a seat away uh, from the Republicans in New Hampshire, again with a tremendous um, uh, feminist, uh, Maggie Hassan, who had been the governor. And so we, we picked up a seat in Illinois. Um, uh, we picked up another feminist woman there, who I'm just totally blanking on right now. Uh, 
Duck. Yes. Duck Ward. Tammy Duck. Thank you. Um, tremendous fighter for us. Uh, took it away from a Republican. So we picked up some seats. This next round in the Senate, we're going to have to hold on to what we have. Maybe we get lucky. Um, let's see if uh, the Democrats find a good candidate in Nevada, because the senator there, the Republican Senator Heller, is in a very weakened position. He's even had to say he thinks health care is a right. Um, he's, he's been so bombarded during these town halls. He said, right, I got that right, I got that yeah, to right. Um, but you can't trust him. So I'm hoping they find someone to run against him. It would be nice to take that seat. But we would need to pick up three seats um, in the Senate um, to regain uh, a majority. So it, it just doesn't look like the cards are going to fall in the right direction. But you never know. The, the one lesson in politics, if, if I leave you with nothing else today, is you really never know what's going to happen. You just don't know. You don't know who's going to drop dead. Um, you don't know what scandal is going to emerge. Lots of scandals out there. Um, so you never know. And part of being an organizer and part of being an activist, you've got to constantly be ready to take advantage of an opening when it comes. And so, but I did want to put a plug in for the feminist women who are representing California in Congress because I think they really are doing a tremendous job. And Kamala Harris is already making her mark uh, on the U.S. Senate for, for a first year in the U.S. Senate. So we're fighting back. But when we're fighting back, we also have to keep our eye on the future. And we have to try and find a way forward. And so the feminist majority is, is part of a national uh, coalition effort um, to keep fighting for the Equal Rights Amendment. If we had an Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution, we wouldn't have to be as worried about the gutting of Title IX because we would have a constitutional right to equality to bring to the table to bring to the courtroom when we're fighting. Um, we wouldn't, I think, um, have to be as worried about the loss of access to contraception um, under these Trump care versions, because we could claim that to target women's health care and take away women's health care is discriminatory. And, and if we had an equal rights amendment, we could make that argument. Uh, so, Without an equal rights amendment, we're in a very weakened position to fight some of these legislative efforts to roll back the clock. Um, we know that ERA would help women and girls in cases of discrimination in education, employment, wages, insurance benefits, scholarships, military service, social security, violence against women, and so much more. Uh, uh, at least we would have a bedrock principle of equality in the highest law of the land. Um, to fight with. Um, as I said, we're in a leadership role in this uh, national coalition. We're working with Representative Carolyn Maloney from New York. She's introduced a new version of the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, we're working with her to get close sponsors. She keeps plugging away, plugging away. Um, we're also very active in what's known as the three state strategy. And that theory is this in, in a nutshell. The Congress, in its infinite wisdom, 98% male at the time, in 1972, when they passed the Equal Rights Amendment out of Congress by a two-thirds vote of both houses and sent it to the states. So the way you get an amendment to the Constitution is, is both the House and the Senate have to have a two-thirds vote, and then it goes to the states. 38 state legislatures, not the people, but 38 state legislatures have to vote to ratify that amendment. Once you get 38, it becomes part of the Constitution. But as I said, in its infinite wisdom, that Congress put a timeline in the preamble, in the preamble, which is key, not in the amendment itself, but in the introduction to the amendment. They put a seven-year time limit, knowing that it would be very difficult, because where, where the movement ran into total roadblocks at the end of the day, of course, was the Deep South. Uh, but Beyond that, uh, there were also roadblocks in other states. I'll talk about that briefly. But the, the, as the seven-year time limit was approaching in 1979, there, there became a huge movement led by now, the National Organization for Women, to remove the timeline. 
So again, in its infinite wisdom, by then it's about 3% limit in Congress, they lengthen the time limit by two and a half years. Knowing they were cutting short a second round of elections at the state level. What was happening then is the movement to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment was the largest grassroots movement of its time until then. There were literally thousands and thousands of women uh, cross, crisscrossing the country, going to state capitals, lobbying, mobilizing voters at, at the grassroots level. There was tremendous support for the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, tremendous uh, supermajority support. Uh, and so they would target a state legislature like in Florida, and they would come within one vote of winning the House. It might pass in the Senate, there was one vote in the House. So they would target the votes that had voted against the Equal Rights Amendment. And in the next round of elections, they got rid of some of those. <coughs> and so then some new people came in who were pro-ERA. And they thought, okay, we'll go back for a vote. And this time we'll win. Well, they go back for a vote, and a couple of other guys have been pulled off of it now. And as the movement looked very closely at what was going on, it understood exactly what was happening. Uh, it was the business interests that opposed the Equal Rights Amendment. It was the insurance companies that are overcharging women billions of dollars a year for the health insurance that men are paying less for and for the life insurance and annuities. It was the U.S. Chamber of Commerce that had a very active anti-ERA uh, campaign going in all the state capitals. It was the Manufacturers Association of America, totally anti-ERA. There were hired lobbyists by all the big law firms that worked for the chamber or worked for the manufacturers. That was the opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment, not what many of us have been led to believe. It was not women. It was not conservative women. They were the, they were the recruited front for the business interests that are very happy to this day to only be paying 79 cents on the dollar in wages to women. That are very happy to this day not to have uh, more demands for women's equal representation on their boards and their executive suites and in benefits of paid family and child care. They're very happy with the way things are. And they put their dollars and their effort into it. So 1982, June 30th passes, and, and the campaign is, is dismantled. Everybody thinks it's over. But about five years ago, a new legal theory came forward that if they could change the time limit once, they could change it again. Because it's not part of the amendment, it's part of the introduction preamble. So there's a whole effort to do just that. Um, Jackie Spear, who's from California, uh, San Jose, Congresswoman Jackie Spear, is one of the leaders of that movement in the House. Um, and I can very proudly tell you that we started this uh, renewed drive with 35 states having ratified. Nevada became the 36th state to ratify on March 22nd, exactly 40 years after the original year was passed. Now, how did we do that? Um, Feminist Majority was actually part of that. We flipped the state legislature from red to blue for the first time in a generation and elected a lot of feminist women in the Nevada state legislature. Uh, both the Senate and the House. Now it has the second highest percentage of women in the state legislature in the country. It's, a, it's about 48%. And uh, they had been waiting for their opportunity and uh, immediately introduced the resolution and it passed. Um, so we've added them, now we have 36 states, so we're gonna have to call it the two-state strategy. Uh, but we're not giving up, that's the major point. We're not giving up. We got to keep organizing because it's going to we have a lot of hurdles to go. If we get 38 states, then we got to fight the Congress to get the extension uh, lifted retroactively on the time limit. If we win that, we're going to have to go to the Supreme Court. That's why we have to have no more originalists uh, appointed to the court. It's not going to be an easy fight, but if we show our power and our strength like we did on January 21st, we're going to be a very, very tough uh, crowd to deal with. And that's the advantage of keeping organizing. And if we went back the House and we get it through the House, then maybe we can embarrass the Senate. So all of the organizing is so critical. 
Um, and I urge you all, if, you, if you're not already involved at a grassroots level, in organized effort, get involved. And we can help um, and keep informed through this magazine. We've given everybody today a card. If you fill it out, you get a free year of the magazine. Um, Ms. Is, is a communications vehicle for the feminist movement <laughs> very large. Um, we publish it, the feminist majority, but it's not a, it's not a house for it. It is very much talking about what's going on around the country, hooking you with uh, activists all over the country with organized efforts. Um, it's a very critical uh, place for information. Uh, and as you heard in the introduction, um, Karen Jolna is, heads our Ms. in the Classroom program to work with uh, women's studies faculty, uh, multicultural faculty, sociology, political science, to incorporate the magazine as a required textbook. And so we put together a, a, a collection, uh, a library of these magazines and curate them. We also have a gender, race, and class reader. Um, and it's all very contemporary and very accessible by students. Uh, but I, I will end by just urging not only activism, but feminist activism. We have to be the voice um, in these town halls that constantly bring up the issues that most significantly impact women and girls um, across the board. Uh, so we can't just let the men be out there talking about pre-existing conditions being eliminated from trunk care without us being there talking about how if you eliminate pre-existing conditions, you eliminate the survivors of breast cancer, you eliminate women who have had cesarean sections, you eliminate women who have been victims of domestic violence. That is considered a pre-existing condition under Trump care. But no one's going to raise those issues but us. And so I do urge you to stay connected, stay informed, stay very loud, and anything that we can do to help you in this mission of taking back our democracy, we want to. So I really do appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and, and I hope that some of you will want to get directly involved or find ways that we can be helpful to you, because that, that's our whole purpose of existing, um, is to keep uh, moving forward towards full equality uh, for women and girls in the U.S. and to be a, a force for, for women and girls all over the world. So thank you very much.